So welcome to the 22nd annual Margaret Angus Research Fellowship public presentation. Uh, my name is Marla Dobson and I'm the curator of the Museum of Healthcare at Kingston. Um, this fellowship is named after Dr. Margaret Angus, who was a significant contributor to Heritage Community in Kingston. And um, we, so we honor her with the naming of this fellowship. And uh, it allows the museum to produce high quality research uh, on a topic that is relevant to our collections. This year I would like to introduce Victoria Bowen. Victoria is a first year's master's student here at Queen's University and is really interested in the intersection of art and medicine. For the past four months, Victoria has been working tirelessly to piece together a picture of life at Rockwood at the end of the 19th century. Using both objects from the collection as well as archival material from across Ontario, Victoria's paper, The Perpetual Caregiver, Charles Kirk Clark and the Treatment of Women at Rockwood Asylum, 1885 to 1905, We'll explore how gender had an impact on care for both staff and patients under the superintendency of Charles Kirk Clark. On behalf of the museum, I would like to thank Victoria, as well as Dr. Jane Arrington, who for years has been lending her historical expertise as a co-supervisor for the fellowship. I would also like to thank the trustees of the estate of Larry Gibson for their generous support of this year's fellowship. And without further ado, please welcome Victoria. everybody. Uh, thank you so much for spending some of your precious time here with me tonight. Before I get started, I just wanted to thank the Museum of Healthcare at Kingston team and the selection committee for taking a chance on me and what started as a fairly abstract research project. Uh, as well, a big thank you to my supervisors, Marla Dobson and Dr. Jane Arrington, for their support, guidance, and reassurance along the way. Tonight, I will be speaking to you about Rockwood Asylum under the tenure of Superintendent Charles Kirk Clark between the years of 1885 and 1905. This man with the wonderful mustache is him. <laughs> that 20 year period was ripe with institutional change, primarily stemming from Clark's passions about the improvement of standards in the Canadian asylum system. Clark's vision would ultimately affect the role of women in the institution with changes enacted on both the patient and staff level. Gender had a large impact on the care both provided and received at Rockwood in the late 19th and early 20th century, and I hope to share some of my findings about that with you tonight. Before I discuss Rockwood specifically, this is Rockwood um, from a period accurate photograph, I wanted to provide you all with some background information on the nature and conception of insanity as recognized by society in the 19th century. Please note, I will be using the term insanity at times throughout the presentation to represent certain kinds of mental illness as they did in the period, um, as this was the dominant language used, even if we don't love that term today. The 19th century was a period of exploration and innovation, particularly in the field of medicine. Psychiatry was first recognized as an area of specialization in the 1840s which caused major changes in both societal and professional views of what it meant to be insane. By the second half of the 1800s, insanity was becoming viewed as an increasingly gendered concept, with women being deemed more susceptible to mental illness due to a number of factors, primarily linked to the differences between men and women. Physical differences of the sexes were linked to insanity, primarily in regards to the reproductive system. Western doctors at the time believed that the female sexual organs, particularly the ovaries and the uterus, were complex, temperamental, and teeming with disease. A woman was believed to be at risk of developing insanity once she started to undergo puberty, as this meant the reproductive system woke up, should we say, and could start wrecking havoc. If a woman experienced too much excitement, too much stress, or any other strong emotion during this time, her ovaries could assume total domination over her body, therefore causing insanity. Dr. Buck, superintendent of the London Asylum in the late 1800s, actually wrote in one of his papers, a young woman is almost equally liable to the constant domination of one emotional state after another. That is the age of impulse and passion. It is the age of bad poetry in men and hysteria in the female. While young men clearly could creatively express their strong hormonal urges, young women were believed to be ill if they had similar experiences, perpetuating a biased system. 
Joseph Workman, superintendent of the Toronto Asylum from 1854 to 1875, believed women's bodies would simply break down under stress, as if they were faulty machinery. There was a commonly held belief that women were naturally empathetic, and this also affected concepts of female insanity. Some physicians suggested that women were empathetic in their very souls. And because of this, if a part of their physical body became ill or injured, it was likely their mental state would also be affected as well. This emotional frailty was seen as the ultimate proof to some that women were the weaker sex, solidifying the dominant male societal role. After all, why would you place responsibility on a woman when it could cause her to malfunction and subsequently have to spend the rest of her life in an asylum? Now that we have discussed some common societal viewpoints about female insanity, I would like to draw your attention to the place a mentally ill woman at the time could have ended up, the insane asylum. The asylum we're going to be talking about tonight is Rockwood Asylum here in Kingston, or was here in Kingston, located in Portsmouth Village. It was originally conceived of purely as an asylum strictly for the criminally insane. In 1835, the Crown purchased 36 acres of an estate previously owned by politician John Cartwright, located in Portsmouth Village. The property was bought with the intention of building a small asylum, as I said, to serve as a facility for the mentally ill inmates located at Kingston Penitentiary, many of whom at that time were serving their sentence in the basement of the prison's dining hall. Having the criminally insane at the penitentiary was turning into a little bit of a problem. 19th century inmates had to adhere to a strict silence policy, not speak unless spoken to by a guard, and therefore this regulation was very difficult to maintain with the presence of the mentally ill. Although the Crown bought the old Cartwright property in 1835, only a half mile from the prison, the first patients were not moved onto the estate's grounds until approximately 1854, about 20 years later. The original patients were not the expected group of incarcerated men, but approximately 20 mentally ill women. Originally seen as a temporary solution, these women would live in refurbished stables on the property for the next 13 years, awaiting a space in the purpose-built asylum to be designed by William Coverdale, the city of Kingston's chief architect. This image on the screen is a drawing of the original plan for Rockwood Asylum. The women who lived in the stables likely fared better than the men housed at the penitentiary. Throughout Kingston, the stables are viewed as a very impressive structure, with a local individual petting the following verse to describe the building in 1857. How much I wish that I were able to build a house like Cartwright's stable, for then I should feel no remorse in faring worse than Cartwright's horse. So in hearing this beautiful piece of poetry, let's take a look at what these stables actually looked like. So this is an exterior shot, again, period accurate, from um, the stables. So a decent building. Uh, the stables on the inside contained a central day area where the women were expected to exercise with communal dormitories on either side. Adjoining this was a wooden building that housed both a dining room and a kitchen. This was the only structure on the Cartwright property until construction began on the main asylum in the fall of 1859. Groups of convicts traveled daily from the penitentiary to complete the project. Limestone, the primary building material, was also provided by the penitentiary, mined from its quarries and cut in the prison workshops, where it would then be transported to Rockwood. Mentally ill male patients were admitted to the main building beginning in 1862, as small sections of the building were completed. Female patients were admitted to the asylum proper starting in 1868, after the completion of the west wing of the building, at which point the stables were decommissioned. Men and women were housed separately and did not interact. This is the same for the period we're going to be talking about under Clark's tenure. The facility was officially declared finished in 1870 and purchased by the province in 1877, marking its entrance into the Ontario social welfare system. Looking at the photographs, we can see that the exterior of the asylum and the grounds surrounding it were quite nice. And this was actually a very dominant viewpoint held by the locals. A journalist for the Daily British Whig remarked in 1857 that the asylum was, quote, one of the finest sites in Canada. The scenery is picturesque in the extreme. 
and as such must strike the senses, even of the lunatic. This idealized, sure, aesthetically pleasing exterior masked some of the horrors that took place inside the walls during the institution's first few decades of operation. The first superintendent, J.P. Litchfield, held the position from 1855 until 1868. Litchfield styled himself as a doctor, although there is conjecture over whether or not he actually held a medical degree. Mm -hmm. Historians today, many of them believe that he was actually a con man. He came from Australia and basically made his medical knowledge up. Under Litchfield and his successor, actual Dr. John Dixon, surviving descriptions of the state of the asylum showcase dismal condition and mistreatment of patients. A Mr. Evans wrote about his visit to the institution in 1864, during the Litchfield era. He noted that the beds were made of straw and that the building was lit by coal lamps. Remarking on the medical care, or lack thereof, Evans stated that Litchfield was the only doctor at the institution. The other staff members were untrained. The patients were not allowed to use forks or knives, instead having to eat with spoons or their fingers. All meat was cut into bite-sized pieces. Dr. William Metcalf, the third superintendent of the institution, wrote on his arrival about the brutal and unfit attendants who were utilizing physical restraint on 10% of all patients in the institution at the time. Therapeutic procedures at this time focused heavily on control, with sedatives such as opium, chloral hydrate, and potassium bromide being distributed to the patients to make them easier to manipulate. Dr. Dixon died in 1878, at which point Dr. William Metcalf, on the left here, assumed the superintendent's role and began to implement more humane treatment, a practice he would work on and be succeeded in by Charles Kurt Clark, on the right. Clark first arrived at Rockwood in 1881 to act as assistant superintendent to Dr. Metcalf. Metcalf had specifically asked for Clark, as both were protégés of Joseph Workman, another very famous psychiatrist of the time. One of Metcalf's first actions was to construct two cottages as housing for long-term patients, believing a home-like environment was beneficial to healing. Metcalf also started farming at the institution, a practice that would grow under Clark and become a means of self-sufficiency. That same year, 1878, Metcalf banned the use of physical restraint and drastically lowered the use of chemical restraint, only applying them in extreme cases. Patients were provided knives and forks, and the quality of food was drastically improved. A telephone system was installed, and a free mail delivery system to Kingston was created. Metcalf also removed attendants who were deemed brutal, drunken, or too elderly to succeed in this position. The partnership between Metcalf and Clark was proving to be a very valuable working relationship. Metcalf's tenure at the institution was unfortunately cut short on August 13, 1885, when he was fatally stabbed by a patient. Clark and Metcalf had been making their daily morning rounds of the institution. Upon reaching the South Cottage, the building shown here, a patient suffering from a paranoid attack approached the two doctors and stabbed Metcalf in the abdomen with a homemade weapon he had constructed from two knives. Clark was also struck, but managed to fight the patient off. He carried Metcalf back to the main building of the institution. Metcalf died within days of the attack, and Clark lost not only a valued colleague, but a brother-in-law, as Metcalf had married one of Clark's sisters in 1883. Now, one thing that is really interesting is actually the day before Metcalf had been attacked, Clark had written his resignation from the institution planning to move back to Hamilton, where he had been previously, and open a private practice. Although very passionate about his job and the well-being of the mentally ill, Clark could not stand the hold the government had on its institutions. The death of Metcalf changed everything, however. Clark was offered the medical superintendent position, which he accepted, a decision he later said he made to keep the institution out of government hands. Clark did not waste time in by implementing changes that had likely been discussed as next steps with Metcalf prior to his demise. In the first year of his tenure, he completed another thorough sweep of the attendants, removing those he deemed unfit for the position. Clark also removed the cage-like airing courts used for patient exercise and became interested in moral treatment philosophies, a framework that would greatly influence his decisions for the next two decades.
So, what was moral treatment? Unfortunately, moral treatment was never explicitly explained by its practitioners. No one sat down and said, moral treatment is this, and everyone accepted it. This has made it very difficult to describe today. From my understanding and what I have read, the best explanation I have found of the key philosophy of moral treatment was written by an American physician, Pliny Earle, in 1845. He said that the framework's primary objective was to, quote, treat the patient so far as their condition will possibly admit, as if they were still in the enjoyment of the healthy exercise of their mental facilities, end quote. Moral treatment was intended to be holistic and to incorporate healing into every part of a patient's day. From dawn until dusk, practitioners of moral treatment strictly scheduled a patient's activities, with these activities chosen based on their therapeutic benefits. Ideally, a patient undergoing moral treatment would hold a job at the institution, take part in a variety of recreational amusements, exercise frequently, eat a healthy diet, attend religious services, and cultivate appropriate interests. This busy schedule is meant to distract the patient from their own mind, allowing for optimal healing to take place. Moral treatment today is considered by some to be the first practical effort for responsible care of the mentally ill. This ideological focus could be seen as a precursor in some ways to current views on healthy lifestyle choices. Moral treatment may have been a step in the right direction, but it was by no means perfect. Scholar Danielle Terbench states that moral treatment was designed for men and only adapted for women. This viewpoint is highly relevant to the experiences of female patients at Rockwood Asylum, even under the care of Dr. Clark. Although superintendents who subscribe to moral treatment philosophies may have attempted to utilize the principles to benefit all patients at the institution, women were still expected to fulfill what was believed to be their natural caregiving role. This responsibility derailed some of the therapeutic effects of the framework. So let's look at some of the tenets of moral therapy in detail. The first of those was work therapy. Moral treatment practitioners strongly endorsed patient labor in the institutions. Work was seen as a distraction for the mind. Completing repetitive, productive tasks were viewed as essential to reinstalling regular, middle-class habits in those who were mentally ill. Holding a job and performing allotted tasks allowed for the patient's day to be filled with something worthwhile. Clark opposed the previous practice of having patients spend the majority of their time sitting aimlessly in a day room. Although the superintendent may have disapproved of his charges being idle, no one was ever forced to work. The majority of patients who were able to did decide to work and would complete their jobs in the mornings and afternoons between meals. Male patients at the institution have been partially responsible for the completion of building projects around the institution since its inception. The fact that Clark was interested in employing the vast majority of patients was therefore not a unique or revolutionary idea. However, his insistence on the therapeutic nature of the work was. By gathering a large patient workforce, the institution was also able to cut employment costs. This reduction in staff meant that patients were called upon to perform many of the daily tasks necessary for the asylum's success. Unlike the inmates at the nearby penitentiary who were paid for their work, Provincial asylum labor was free, as patients did not have to be compensated. As patients were involved in nearly every aspect of daily operations, this saved the institution a significant amount of money, as it could operate with a significantly smaller staff. Work, just like every aspect of asylum life, was segregated by gender. Men often worked outside on building projects, landscaping, or in the various workshops. Many male patients also worked on the farms, growing the majority of the asylum's food. Women worked primarily inside. The female patients of the institution were responsible for the majority of the cleaning, laundry, and mending duties. Cleaning doctor's quarters, serving meals, etc. A small amount of male patients were employed in these more domestic roles, again due to the separation in the institution. However, it was a very small amount compared to the female indoor workforce. Adherence to moral therapy also followed, felt that physical work completed outdoors was the most beneficial for the mentally ill, as it allowed them to both exercise and experience nature, two tenets of the care model. Outdoor work was weather dependent and would conclude once night fell, or cease to be as strenuous in the winter months. 
This allowed the group of patients who worked outside to spend their time more equally balanced between their occupations and their amusements, another integral part of moral therapy we will talk about in just a moment. As the vast majority of outdoor workers were male, they benefited from the system at a greater level than their indoor and typically female counterparts. The utilization of the patient workforce allowed for the dismissal of hired domestic staff, meaning that patients employed in this field were relied upon to ensure the institution ran smoothly. Female patients were therefore unable to take the same amount of time off to explore leisure activities as their male counterparts due to the responsibilities on them. Although completing domestic work and building projects could be viewed as beneficial, one job held by certain trusted female patients was particularly exploitive. Certain women were charged with supervising and caring for other patients, taking on an unpaid attendant role. Suicidal patients at the institution had long slept in dormitories instead of individual rooms as a way to ensure their safety. Up to 11 patients would sleep in one of these rooms and would be checked on by a night attendant once an hour. In the annual report for 1887, very early on in Clark's tenure, he outlined a new procedure he had implemented in the female suicide ward. To such a success, it is used with the men. Clark felt that the night watches were not enough to properly ensure safety, and so decided to place a trustworthy chronic patient in the ward, detailed to watch her companions. How can individuals who are in a hospital for treatment be asked to watch others in the same treatment facility? Wouldn't the stress of ensuring fellow patients did not commit suicide not negatively affect these caretakers' own potentially fragile mental health? It must be noted that this system was practiced on the female patients first and only moved to the male patients once deemed successful. The choice to start with the women may be explained through the naturally sympathetic nature all women supposedly possessed. A moment. The next tenet is exercise. Exercise and diet were strictly monitored by psychiatrists who practiced moral treatment. Exercise was generally viewed as an important therapeutic agent. All patients at Rockwood who were physically capable were encouraged to exercise. Patients, especially those who did not work, were encouraged to walk the grounds of the institution at least once daily. Clark also implemented daily physical culture classes in 1890 specifically for patients who did not work at physically demanding jobs, who he acknowledged were primarily the women of the institution. These classes involved the women completing dumbbell and Swedish movement exercises alongside calisthenics. These classes would last for about an hour and would run daily. These motions would be accompanied by a nurse on the piano. Clark believed these classes were imperative to keeping order at the institution as they acted as a natural sedation for violent female patients. By exhausting these women through exercise, they would be unable to act up and cause trouble for the staff. Alongside exercise, a proper diet was a crucial tenet of moral treatment. It was argued that nutritious food improved a person's psychological functions as it allowed for better brain activity. Under Clark's instruction, all patients at Rockwood ate the same diet, regardless of their social status, gender, or financial status, which was a fairly new idea. Up on the screen now is a typical weekly menu at the institution, as described by a visiting physician to Rockwood in 1885. As we can see, it is fairly repetitive, a lot of meat, some grains, not really vegetables. These offerings would be quite similar to this throughout the year, obviously pulling on food that was in season and could be grown on the farm. Even though it is repetitive, the menu shows a drastic change from the cut up and mashed foods provided by the institution mere decades earlier. The majority of the food consumed by the patients was grown on the asylum's farm, as I already mentioned, which was again beneficial to the asylum's budget. Recreational activities were believed to be very, very important in the treatment of insanity. As the day to day activities of the institution were strictly scheduled and fairly regimented, Amusements act as a welcome change from daily life and could be used as an incentive for good behavior. Metcalf began many of the activities that Clark would continue to run throughout his time at the institution. Patients were entertained by staff minstrel and dramatic troops in O'Reilly Hall, which you can see on the left, an auditorium built specifically for these performances. 
Reading was encouraged and patients were able to borrow sensible books from the asylum's library. In the summers, patients took weekly trips around the lake on a rented steam yacht. Select groups of patients would sometimes travel into the city to attend fairs or concerts, circuses, etc. Choirs from every major Kingston church, as well as the cadets from the Royal Military College, were some of the many groups that came to Rockwood to entertain the patients. Organized sports like tennis and bicycling were popular activities among the men. Women were not included in sports as they were considered to benefit more from lower impact individual activities. Possibly the most promoted recreational activities were those associated with music. Both the provincial government and asylum administration believed music was therapeutic and therefore preferred to hire staff that had musical training and could therefore play for or instruct the patients. Clark himself was a lover of music and a rather talented cellist and violinist later becoming one of three non-professional players in the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. The doctor brought this love of music with him to work and personally sought out male patients who wanted to take lessons to populate a 25-piece orchestra. After a number of Kingston performances, the local newspapers commended Clark, calling the orchestra, and I quote, the best within a 20-mile radius. It appears these bands were composed of male patients with female patients being regulated to learning singing. By not being members of these bands, women had even less opportunity to leave the institution's walls. Although Clark preferred to adhere to moral therapy frameworks at the institution, alternate treatments were still employed in specific cases where further intervention was deemed necessary. Surgery on the mentally ill was becoming a contested issue in Canada during the time of Clark's superintendency, with Clark himself viewing it as very, very radical. From the annual reports spanning the two decades Clark ran the institution, he mentions only three surgeries taking place, all on female patients. Compared to the other institutions at the time, this is a very, very low number. Two of these surgeries took place on female epileptics, where they removed part of their skull to assist with seizures, and the final surgery was gynecological. Gynecological. Wow, I can't say that word, apparently. In 1888, um, Batty's operation was performed, which was a surgical procedure that consisted of removing healthy ovaries to invoke early menopause. This happened at the institution. Due to the belief that insanity in women could sometimes be a part of that menstrual cycle, right? The start of puberty. And it was thought by ceasing that bodily activity, insanity would lift. This practice was hearkened as an insanity cure since 1878. However, it was controversial for a number of reasons. One of the most contested aspects of the surgery was that physicians of the time were not entirely sure the function of the ovaries and what would happen if they were removed. It was kind of a guess at best. Not really what you want to hear. Although Clark did approve this surgery in 1888, he wrote afterwards that he was not impressed by the results, noting that it failed to exert the slightest benefit or effect on the patient's mental condition. This surgery was likely not repeated at Rockwood again during Clark's time, yet this woman did suffer unnecessary pain from a procedure that did nothing to help her. If the woman was truly as mentally ill as implied, there is a little chance she would have been able to properly consent to this procedure. This surgery should be noted as an example that not all of Clark's views were as progressive as they may be considered today. The other major change Clark made at the institution was to introduce training for female staff which led to the establishment of one of the first psychiatric nursing schools in North America. Prior to institutional staffing reforms carried out by Metcalf and, Metcalf and Clark, the attendants who worked at Rockwood Asylum were not viewed as being of the highest caliber. Trained nurses at hospitals and asylums were not seen as necessary for most of the 19th century due to the widely held belief that women were natural caregivers. Women didn't need to be taught anything they would be able to provide basic medical care from their innate feminine abilities alone. During its early years, Rockwood employed an equal number of male and female attendants, each responsible for the care of their own sex. The duties of the attendants in the first decades of institutional operation were extensive and varied. Prior to 1877, the male attendants made $30 monthly and female attendants $10 monthly. After 1877, the male salary was lowered to $20 a month, however, the women's wage did not change. 
Expected to do the exact same jobs, female attendants did not receive the same monetary compensation for their work as their male counterparts. The women were also subject to stricter rules based around their conduct and their leisure hours. In the first few decades of the institution, for example, if you were a female attendant and you wanted to leave the grounds, even on your own time, you had to receive permission from the superintendent. When Clark took over as superintendent, he considered this meager salary a large problem. He felt the attendants were not being paid enough to take their job seriously. This, accompanied by the fact that poor wages were not attracting the proper class of individuals to the position, led Clark to petition the government to raise the attendant salary. He was successful in obtaining a 25% wage increase for the female staff in 1888. In light of these events, Clark decided that all female attendants would be required to undergo training at the institution. If any current staff member refused, they would be asked to leave their position. This training would ensure better care and allow for the introduction of more innovative treatments. Clark was unable to secure the same government funding for a similar program for the male attendants. Male patients would not receive trained care administered by nurses until 1911, 23 years after the female patients began to benefit. The reasoning behind Clark's championing of the women's raise was likely not due to his progressive views on equal pay, but perhaps stemmed from the contemporary beliefs about feminine nurture. If women were natural caregivers, training would boost their already innate qualities and greatly benefit the institution. Male attendants, which were often described as brutal and drunk, may have seemed a more difficult cause, making the idea of providing these men with some medical training less palatable. Clark believed that the nursing school would attract young women of means and intelligence. At the time, most of the available female attendants were middle-aged and of the working class with few other prospects. The low skill level and general age of the attendants did not match the appearance that Clark wished to garner at Rockwood. Clark felt his school would stand out as both unique and exclusive and therefore be attractive to the individuals he wished to attend. The first training session for Rockwood Asylum's female staff occurred on March 15, 1887, well, when Assistant Superintendent Dr. Millman delivered a casual lecture to a few attendants. The topic of this lecture is unknown, however, it appears to have been well received and was deemed a success by Clark. On April 12, 1888, the foundation of the Rockwood Training School for Nurses was announced, made possible due to government support. The school was advertised as the first of its kind in North America. Applicants had to be under 35 years of age and single. They were required to pass a preliminary English exam and provide satisfactory references. Once accepted, the program would take two years to complete and consisted of weekly lectures on topics related to physiology, anatomy, and nursing of both the physically and mentally ill. A practical component was prioritized, leading Clark to hire a head nurse to lead these sessions. To complete the program, a nurse was expected to pass both her junior and senior year with at least 50% in each subject, where she would be tested by an impartial city physician. The first class of seven students from the Rockwood Training School for Nurses graduated in 1890 and became the first specifically trained asylum nurses in the country. By 1903, the school offered an extensive curriculum taught by various individuals at the institution. Nurses were expected to be proficient in both mental health nursing and physical nursing, as well as to have knowledge of the various mental illnesses and how they may appear. On the screen, I have listed only some of the topics that the nurses were expected to master. The list is much more extensive, which highlights the intensive nature of the program. This was especially important to Clark, who noted in 1889, that the school opens up a field that is worthy of cultivation by girls of education and refinement, and graduates will never find difficulty obtaining work. The curriculum was divided into four major sections. Nursing and mental diseases, which was taught by Clark. General nursing, which was taught by the head nurse. General medicine, which was taught by various physicians. And anatomy and physiology, also taught by various physicians. Oop. Alongside their medical duties, nurses were instructed in basic housekeeping and vermin prevention, taught how to complete patient intake, and instructed in methods of force feeding. Nurses learned how to administer hydrotherapy treatment to female patients, a process that included massages, excessive sweating, and the application of hot and cold water. 
Additionally, nurses were trained in after-death procedures and were expected to assist in autopsies if necessary. Nurses were also relied upon as patient companions, expected to play music, read aloud, and supervise walks at a moment's notice. They wore a lot of hats at the institution. <laughs> In addition to the nurses' exhaustive medical schedule, these wide-ranging responsibilities had an additional benefit for the institution at large. The establishment of a school allowed for a constant flow of cheap labor in the form of nurses and training, which directly supplemented the institutional budget. All about the bottom line. The employment of female nurses also drastically reduced payroll expenses as the students were not compensated. If the women were retained by Rockwood upon graduation, they would be paid based on their gender, not their medical training and subsequent experience. This meant that the untrained male attendant continued to benefit from the system. They often had higher salaries than the women, even though the nurses were competent medical professionals. After the two years of study, nurses could sometimes gain employment at Rockwood. However, the majority were expected to find their own way. Of the 37 nurses who graduated from the school between 1890 and 1900, only eight nurses were retained by the institution. Out of the others, a vast majority of them got married. Um, some worked at other institutions, some worked in private nursing, and some were recorded as being at home. Clark felt that the graduates from the Rockwood program were of a higher caliber than nurses graduating from other hospital programs stating, an ideal asylum nurse requires to be a person of higher intelligence than the average hospital nurse. Clark would write upon leaving the institution in 1905 about the success of the training school. The greatest revolution was affected by the establishment of the training school for nurses. And when I look abroad and see how many of the graduates have reached success, I am indeed proud of the results achieved. If what is here known as the Rockwood spirit has manifested itself anywhere, it is in the school for nurses. The relation between nurse and patient is a very different thing from that between attendant or keeper and patient. Charles Kurt Clark left Rockwood Asylum, by then officially named Rockwood Hospital for the Insane, in 1905, after the Liberal government was defeated. Clark was tired of the long bureaucratic processes required for any changes at the institution, and felt unable to cope with the Conservative government, feeling that the system would become even more fraught. He accepted the position of superintendent at the Toronto Asylum, a position he retained until he became superintendent of Toronto General Hospital in 1911. Clark would later become Dean of Medicine at the University of Toronto in 1908 and opened Canada's first outpatient, outpatient psychiatry clinic in 1914. A professor, royal commissioner, committee member and author, Clark passed away due to heart failure on January 20th, 1924. Clark acted as a mentor for many members of the next generation of Canadian psychiatrists, some of whom referred to him as the father of Canadian psychiatry. In 1966, the Clark Institute of Psychiatry, now the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto, was named in his honour. Under Clark's tenure at Rockwood, the institution strived to provide the best care available to the mentally ill. These efforts, although valiant, fell short in some cases primarily regarding expectations placed on the women of the institution. Female patients were expected to take responsibility for not only their own well-being, but the care of their fellow patients. Female attendants were expected to undergo intensive training that would lead to greater responsibilities for similar benefits. Although Clark meant well, typical 19th century ideologies that directly informed the treatment of women positioned their well-being as inferior sometimes to the budgetary concerns and ultimate success of the institution. Clark may have introduced moral and other innovative treatments, as well as campaigning for the destigmatization of mental illness. However, he still partook in an exploitive system that relied on women. I think it's important to acknowledge that his successes would not have been as possible without the women of Rockwood. The patients, who provided free labor to ensure the asylum retained its appearances, and the nurses, who worked daily and tires tirelessly with the patients, served as a key part of the backbone of the institution. Although women in the 19th century were sometimes seen as natural caregivers, the women at Rockwood Asylum proved that they could leave the home and still succeed, whether on receiving treatment for their mental illness or through employment at an institution, therefore directly challenging these blank notions of 19th century womanhood. Thank you so much for taking the time to hear about my research. Um, if you're interested in reading a more detailed and in-depth exploration of the topic, my manuscript will soon be available um, on the Museum of Healthcare website. 
Um, I hope this was informative and piqued your interest in gendered notions of care here in Kingston. Thank you.